just by way of background, Dr. Dixon has spent most of her 15-year career at this point in the intelligence sphere, um, working for the CIA, mm -hmm. um, the National Geo... And others, yes. And others, yeah. right? National Geospatial... Intelligence in Agency. Intelligence Agency. You worked on the Hill in an oversight capacity. For the past two years, you were the Deputy Director of IARPA, and now, since September, you're the Director. Correct. Uh, and your background is in mechanical engineering? Yes. Three advanced degrees? Three degrees. One Three degrees. degrees. Okay. Um, I think the first question is, what is IARPA? Um, for people who don't know and aren't as familiar with it, it's a relatively young agency. It is. We've been around for about 11 years. We are the research organization that supports all of the elements of the intelligence community. And our mission is to take on the research that's either too risky or too long term for the intelligence organizations to take on. We take on that risk for them, deliver them capabilities that hopefully will have a very transformational uh, impact on their mission and help them to do something that they're not currently able to do. So what does that mean in the real world? What are some of the examples of the work that, that you're doing? So a lot of it's about collecting information or processing information. So how do you do more with the information that's out there? How do you create more sensitive sensors, whether it's chemical detection, whether it's ones that can translate and transcribe different languages that are all around the world? Uh, there's any number of different disciplines. So from the biology, chemistry, mathematics, all the way to different types of computing, whether it's cryogenic computing, quantum computing, we sort of cover the, the range of Anything that would be of interest to the intelligence community, we try to do some research in and try to help out. And to do that, you usually partner with outside forces or outside groups? Absolutely. We completely partner. People uh, often call us and say, hey, I want to come by for a tour. And it's like touring an office building. We don't do any in research in-house. It's very underwhelming with respect to that. Uh, but a lot of really smart people who are working very closely with industry and academia and uh, businesses all over the world to try to solve these challenges. Uh, one of the nice things about the research that we undertake is we try to do it at an unclassified level so that people without clearances, people, can, people wherever the talent is, they can generally be part of our research programs, and that's really been a benefit to us. What are some examples? Of the research? Yeah. So we, uh, several years ago, we, we created one of the best facial recognition systems that became what the government, became the gold standard within the government. Um, the, this, the, the group that was the actual creator of it was ended up being bought out by one of the larger uh, tech companies. So uh, we've created, we started another one, and that's actually doing better. So not only can it take, not only just sort of the, the basic mugshot type photos, but we want to be able to understand and recognize a person if they're in a particular database, no matter what angle we have. So whether it's you know, profiles, whether it's kind of you know, back of the head, whatever it is, we want to be able to recognize people. We also do a lot with, face, with uh, language recognition. So we created a program to help us recognize different languages around the world. And, and we're not talking about sort of the common ones, but they're sort of the lower resource languages or ones where you don't have a lot of industry investing and in translating and transcribing them, but they're very important to the intelligence mission. So you, know, you never know where there's going to be a hot spot around the world, and you may not have someone who can translate it. So you want to be able to recognize very quickly what it is so you can find the talent to be able to help out. So will the intelligence agencies come to you and say, this is a problem that we have that we really need to solve? Does, that, does it work that way? That does happen, but more often than not, we have really interested program managers that come to us with a great idea. And they may come from within the intelligence agencies. We do do loan detail assignments where they can come over for several years to work on a program. We also hire from, uh, hire from industry and academia and wherever else, people who want to come into government for three to five years and work on a very, uh, some sort of research program that's very important to them where they could benefit from having resources that are, I can't say unlimited, I wish I could, but generous resources and really a team of worldwide talent to work on the problem. But but your budget is classified, right? It is. OK. <laughs> a little hint? No. Way smaller than DARPA's. <laughs> really? OK. All right. So DARPA, if you probably, maybe you do know, DARPA is the counterpart to IARPA for the Department of Defense. And they also do really cool, interesting things. So, so at what point does the, the project go from an idea and proving that you, you can you know, create something to an actual application? So somewhere in that sort of zero to five year time frame, along the way there may be deliverables that are it's code or hardware that can then be put taken into, and usually we transfer it into, into the research organization within the, one of the intelligence agencies. 
they will then sort of harden it, structure it, put it within one of their operational programs. So anywhere sort of in, sort of in the middle, towards the end of the program, something can be handed off. Uh, sometimes it is towards the end, though, that you get the best, most mature capabilities. And what would you say the success rate is on, of the projects that you take on? How many fail and how many actually do move on to something? So it's, so it's interesting. We, we have a, a, a we quote that about 70% of everything that we are, work on trans, trans, is transitions into, uh, into one of the other agencies. And that might actually be a whole operational capability, which is sort of the best case scenario. It may be data that we create or data that we collect as part of it. It may be a process change that they can then implement within their whatever the processes that they have. And sometimes it's the knowledge of what won't work. So of the 70%, it's more of the things that have been positively taken in. But as we consider failure, we, we try to embrace the failure. Uh, you really can't do high risk research without taking on things that you're not sure are gonna succeed. And we do have things that do fail and don't make it pass. But we try to fail fast so we can move on to something else really right. quickly. So when you're, uh, as an intelligence professional, when you're looking out over the landscape of threats and issues and challenges facing the United States, what do you see out there and what concerns you the most? So of the, of the things that I'm sort of keeping an eye on right now, sort of the whole field of synthetic biology and what people end up using that for, whether it's for good, which there's a lot of very good applications with genome, gene editing, um, but there's also a lot of applications that either through error or through intentional misuse can be very negative for populations. I'm definitely watching computing. Uh, you know, you've been sort of been talking about data and financial data all day. And the use of data, the ability to get understanding out of whatever data sources are out there, it's going to be huge. And so machine learning and other art artificial intelligence, we're watching that and trying to invest in it so that we can also do the same thing with the intelligence community data. You said to me in, in one of our conversations before today that um, whoever is, I think this is the way you phrased it, but whoever is best at harnessing that data will have the edge. That is absolutely true. I'm not the only one that said that. There are definitely other leaders of the other places around the world that have actually said the same thing. Whoever is control and dominates artificial intelligence, um, data and, and analytics is really going to be the one who can can not only take the understanding that you get out of it, but really be able to provide that to decision makers who can then move faster on the information. So it's sort of the whole, um, it's whole, the whole continuum, not only just getting the answers quickly, but getting them to someone who can then do something with them to can then protect your country or make a decision or whatever. And in terms of competitors on that front, uh, you've identified China as, as others have as well. What is it about what they're doing that, that um, concerns you or uh, affects your decision making? So one of the things is they've, they've, they've stated very boldly that they want to dominate in several very uh, important emerging technology fields, whether that's artificial intelligence, whether it's biology and synthetic biology, um, cryogenic computing, quantum computing, you sort of name it, and there are billion dollar investments that they have stated that they're making. Um, not only that, they have the ability to, uh, I'll say incentivize, not only their business, but academics, as well as others to work with the government. And so this sort of whole of country approach with your goal of being more dominant than anyone else in the world, that is concerning. Right, right. And but that's obviously not our system. We can't force everyone to march in the same direction. Correct. So, uh, and, and by the way, we're going to have a polling question shortly, so make sure you have your app open. Um, so when you're going to um, different companies, or do companies come to you and say, we'd like to partner? Okay. They do. It's sort of both ways. We, we put out a, a, a solicitation, essentially a broad agency announcement that announces the research that we want to undertake, and then people can propose to that. And that tends to be teams of academia and research or in industry working together. There are also great ideas that just sort of come to us through a, a process that we have where we just, it's sort of a laundry list of things that we'd be interested in, and anyone can communicate with us as to what their idea is. And it's really not sure your, not your something that you're trying to just commercialize. It's really, you have an idea, you're not even sure it's going to work, but if it works, it's going to be so transformational, not only for intelligence, but just for, for really life in general. I mean, it's something that's going to be so different and so disruptive that you want to get an investment. That might be something that we'd invest in. So what's the most exciting thing you think you're working on right now? That I yeah, or among the most exciting. So there's a couple of interesting ones that are in the neuroscience range, uh, in the neuroscience discipline. So one is looking at uh, neuromorphic computing. So how do you create computers that really more closely mimic the brain? And for us, we're actually trying to take a very small piece of the brain and literally model it so that we have, we know where the neurons are, so you know where the, the, the <laughs> nodes are and then the connections between them, and then try to translate that into an algorithm 
to try to understand why is the brain so good at, at taking and identifying an object. You take a, a toddler and they can see something for the first time and whether it's a giraffe or an elephant, they will forevermore know what a giraffe or elephant is. But if you show a computer one image, most times it's not gonna be able to recognize that same image or it's gonna get confused and think it's something else. How do we learn to make our algorithms more like the brain? So that's one of the ones that I think is pretty exciting because it's, it's more in the basic research realm, but it really could change computing going forward if we're successful and, and really benefit way more than the intelligence community, which uh, that's something else that I think we're, we're uh, actually pretty good at. So, so the applications can migrate from the intelligence community to the, the larger public. Absolutely. And in all of our research programs, we encourage publishing, which, which makes a lot of academia and industry more interested in working with us. So a lot of the findings and a lot of the algorithms and a lot of the data is actually out there for other researchers to take advantage of. Now, there have been recently a couple of examples where um, I, I believe it was Google, where employees there did not want uh, to partner with the government um, on, in, on technology projects because of the concern that it would be used for you know, uh, unpleasant applications, shall we say. Uh, but then there are other companies, uh, you know, I think um, uh, uh, Amazon has said that, uh, you know, they're gonna continue to compete for a huge cloud contract that uh, Google is, is coming out of, uh, is pulling out of. So I wanted to ask our, our polling question, which is, would you wanna partner with uh, the government on uh, technology research projects of the sort that IARPA is doing. So if you could get out your phones and if we can show the poll, we will see what our audience thinks. Yeah? Close? Maybe not. Okay. Um, right. Uh, right. So the question, the answers are yes, uh, no, because I, I don't want it to uh, be used for nefarious purposes. And the third is, do I really have a choice? <laughs> it scared me for a second when that huge second bar went. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. <laughs> well, that's pretty good. It's not bad. So, so yes, there is a choice. You don't have to choose to work with the intelligence community or with the government. But I do want to, for those of you who would make that decision, um, I would just say, it's hard to be competitive with other countries who do have that whole of country approach when there's talent that will not work with the government who is ultimately trying to help protect the country and keep everyone safe. Um, on IARPA's behalf, we have some really interesting problems to work on. And so I think that's what makes some who otherwise hadn't worked with the intelligence community or hadn't worked with government before interested. Uh, we, we put challenges out there that just are really intriguing and um, I think make people think beyond, because we're not trying to do incremental improvements, we're really trying to do those sort of revolutionary changes so we can sort of leapfrog to an outcome that just was not imagined before we sort of asked the question. So when you look out again uh, over that landscape of uh, issues and threats, is there anything that keeps you awake at night um, that you think your agency could help with? Um, or is it more, you know, you're, you're thinking more about these sort of larger issues that may have some application on a, on a practical basis, but may not. You sort of think of all of the different uh, threats in the world that you would want someone to know about as soon as they became, before they became a problem. You know, whether it's someone experimenting in the lab and creating something that ends up getting into the wild that could really impact things. Someone um, interacting and messing with nuclear materials. Uh, someone trying to bring hazardous chemicals into a big public space. All of these things are things that we work on and want to really contribute to because we want to be able to have sensors that are more sensitive than what we have now where we can recognize that things are coming towards us at greater distances so there's less likelihood of, of the public being impacted or someone being negatively impacted by someone seeking to do harm. You recently announced I think a, a new, is it a prize, is it the, the Thor program? Yes. Uh, Explain that a little. Sure. So Thor is one of our biometrics programs, and we're really trying to understand, as, as we move to more biometrics as identifying features, we're trying to understand if someone is presenting an attack. So if someone has you know, fake glasses, fake whatever, uh, and trying to pretend to be something that they're not, how do you know? How, do, how good are the systems that are out there at catching things like that? And I think that's going to be more and more important because, especially for anyone that's using their biometrics with their phone, you don't want someone else being able to get into your phone using those things. And we don't want someone getting into the country 
pretending to be someone that they're not or hiding who they are so that they can get in. So that's the Thor program. Um, and uh, we've got, that was, again, that was sort of the continuation of the other biometrics programs that we've done before. When you talk with uh, leaders in, in industry, do they say to you, you know, how do I justify this to my employees who are concerned that it may be used for nefarious purposes? Or does that not really come up? That hasn't this? come up so far. And even when we have new research ideas and are looking for people, we get interested people that have never worked with us before that are coming forward. So I, I've never had anyone actually ask me that question. Um, I would just say, you know, sort of it, it's for the greater good, right? It's a really interesting research uh, problem. It's one that you're going to be able to publish on. So it's going to impact way more than just the intelligence community. Um, if you're interested in working with us, come on in. If you're not, you know, I understand, but I would, would definitely encourage you to just reconsider and think about what good you could do for not only uh, national security, but for society at large. And how many, uh, you know, cooperative agreements and projects do you have running right now? We have about 40 right now that are current. We've got probably another five that are coming in the next, in the next say, nine, ten months. Uh, we also have prize challenges, which are a really easy way to get access to interesting data an interesting intelligence problem. And if you're the, one of the best solutions, you can win a cash prize from the government without any contracts at all. So there's, there's a number of different ways to in, in, get involved with us.